Okay, aloha. <clears throat> Welcome to lecture 11. We are going to discuss the second half of the central nervous system development. We're going to cover the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system. So it's kind of the beginning and the end of the chapter. We did the middle part already. I know, sorry, it just makes more sense to me if we start at the top and work our way down and out. So that's the way I formatted my lecture. Now, um, I'm on babysitting duty today. So I've got my little 10 month old here next to me. Um, it'll be interesting to see how recording this lecture goes with him here. He might have some things to say. Uh, we'll see. But he's sitting there next to me, just kind of staring at me all cute like at the moment. So if you hear baby noises in the background, uh, I make no apologies because I love my children. So uh, just like we did in the brain, we are going to start by covering a little bit of the basic anatomy of the end product. So we're going to start with, uh, we have first the spinal cord, right? The spinal cord here. We have then the peripheral nervous system, which is divided into two parts. We have the somatic nervous system that is mostly involved with your sense of touch and movement, uh, sensation and movement. And then we have the autonomic nervous system, which is primarily uh, involved with um, you know, organic stuff, your, your heart, your lungs, your liver, your split, your organs, um, and, and tissues. So, um, one thing I want you to notice as we talk about the spinal cord is that in the end, uh, in an adult person, the spinal cord does not go all the way to the end of the spine. It stops right here at about, uh, the L1, L2 level. And what, continues down from there is a bundle of nerve fibers. So you have a, a big bundle of nerve fibers that continue down the spine and they exit the spine two at a time, one on each side until you run out of nerve fibers. So somebody looked at this structure right here, some PhD student long ago and thought, you know, that looks a little bit like a horse's tail to me. <clears throat> so they named that structure the cauda equina, which is Latin for horse tail. Now, if you look at a cross section of the spinal cord, it's gonna look something like this. Uh, the colors won't be quite that distinct, but I can actually tell you from experience, yes, this middle part is much darker and this outer part is much lighter in color. So this center part in here is the gray matter of the spinal cord. And of course the gray matter is where um, cell bodies live, right? Cell bodies live in the gray matter. Out in the perim um, perimeter, periphery here, that uh, is the white matter and the white matter just like is the case in the brain, is all full of axons. Um, bundles of axons called nerve tracts. So um, this part of the gray matter up here is called the dorsal horn, right on the dorsal surface, which is towards the back. Down here we have the lateral horn and the ventral horn. <clears throat> and then through this area right here, this is called the gray commissure. And then uh, out here we have the dorsal nerve root, the ventral nerve root, and these guys come together to form the spinal nerve when they merge. Uh, also this dorsal root ganglion is where the sensory nerve cell bodies live that are coming back to the spine from the body. Uh, here at the back, we have this uh, <clears throat> posterior median sulcus. And then up here at the front, we have the anterior median fissure. So these guys are buttered right up against each other. So it looks kind of like a sulcus in the brain, like the sulca, sulci and the gyri in the brain, right? Down here, um, there's a tiny bit of space between them. So they call that one a fissure or a fissure rather than a sulcus. Now, what these guys do is here in the um, dorsal horn is where all of the incoming nerve synapses happen, right? These are cell bodies for um, visceral sensory nuclei and somatic sensory nuclei, basically all the stuff that's coming in from the body back to the brain synapses in here and it synapses with one of these afferent um, spinal tracts that go straight up to the brain. 
So one neuron that's associated with, you know, sensation or uh, whatever it is that's coming in. Uh, this neuron synapses in here with another neuron that then goes up to the brain, right? Uh, down here in the lateral and the dorsal horn, we have uh, efferent. So these are efferent nuclei, right? And this is where cell bodies live of nerves that are going out to muscles and glands and so on. <clears throat> um, so there's a nerve that comes down from the brain down the spinal cord through one of these uh, white matter tracts. And then it synapses with another neuron in this gray matter, which then goes out to the muscles, so on and so forth. Um, the part in the middle here, the gray commissure, there are no nuclei in there. What the gray commissure does is it connects the two halves of the spinal cord. So as afferent signals come in here, um, sometimes that signal needs to be relayed to here. There's a lot of reflexes that you have, such as, you know, if you get burned, you jerk back. And that involves muscles on both sides of your body. And that happens before you think about it because that happens at the spinal cord level. So that sensory stimulus comes in here, the gray commissure transmits it over to here, and then the reflex happens on both sides of the spine simultaneously, right? So that's the whole purpose of the gray commissure is to just connect the two halves of the spinal cord um, as necessary. So white matter does not have any cell bodies in it. It is strictly made up of axons. Um, these are the wires that connect the different cells together. Um, and, and the groups, the bundles of axons are called tracts. So when you get a whole bunch of, <clears throat> of these wires together, that's called a, a, a nerve tract. Um, so these run from one area of gray matter, usually to another area of gray matter. Uh, I want you to notice that there are a lot more of these spinal tracts, a lot more of the axons in your spinal cord are devoted to uh, stuff going back into the brain, these ascending afferent tracts. There's a lot more of them than the efferent tracts. And there's a reason for that because you have a lot more information going back to your brain and uh, then, then going out of your brain. And I also want you to notice that the bulk of these afferent spinal tracts are devoted to this sensation called proprioception. So for those of you that don't know what proprioception is, proprioception is your body's sense of where it is in space. So um, for example, you can close your eyes and raise your hand and you know that you're raising your hand. If you wiggle your fingers, you know that you're wiggling your fingers. This is proprioception, but there's a lot more to it. Only about 7% of that is conscious and all the rest of it is unconscious. 93% of it you're not even aware of. Your brain is keeping track of every muscle fiber and every tendon and every ligament in your whole body. <clears throat> it knows the amount of tension on every muscle, whether it's getting, whether it's increasing or decreasing, how fast it's increasing or decreasing, the length of every muscle, whether it's getting longer or shorter and how fast it's getting longer or shorter. It knows the angle of every joint, whether that angle is getting bigger or smaller and the rate of change of that angle. Uh, it's keeping track of all of this. And it sends an enormous amount of information <clears throat> through these tracks back to your brain. And this is really, really, really important because your brain then uses that information to figure out the response it's going to make. It, um, you know, as your feet touch the ground, your brain knows about the surface of the ground and it knows if it's getting steeper or, or if it's, uh, you know, if you're going up or if you're going down based on the angles and, and all this proprioceptive information. And then it decides which muscles to contract and how long to contract them for and how hard to contract them. So things like walking and talking, um, <clears throat> exercising, writing, uh, all these things that you do relatively without thinking about it, or, or even the things that you do while thinking about it, uh, riding a bicycle, all this stuff is modulated by these afferent proprioceptive signals. Um, really, really, really important to chiropractors. Chiropractors have a huge effect on these afferent proprioceptive signals when we adjust people. We make sure that those signals are coming through clearly and that there's no interference and they're not garbled. And the brain, it's a supercomputer. And uh, for those of you that have studied computer science at all, you know that if you send garbage to the central processing unit, you get garbage back out of the central processing unit. And that's just kind of how it is. 
right? So what we do as chiropractors is we make sure everything going into the brain is nice and clear and working properly. This is my little 10 month old son talking to us. He's very cute. Um, but anyway, you make sure that the signals going in are proper and that there's less interference so that your brain is able to function better and send appropriate responses out. Uh, it's one of the reasons why chiropractic care is able to have such a profound effect on such a huge variety of conditions that wouldn't necessarily be considered inside of our uh, field, inside of our um, scope of practice. Um, but anyway, I, I, I digress. We need to move on with the lecture. The point is proprioception is really important and that is evidenced by the fact that such a large portion of your spinal cord is devoted to it. Now the somatic nervous system is relatively straightforward. We have nerves that run from the spine to the muscles and nerves that run from the skin and bones and related structures back to the spine. Uh, the outgoing signals come from the brain to the spinal cord using a fiber tract such as the spinal cortical tract, which is this guy over here um, circled in green. Uh, these guys are going to then synapse in one of these anterior um, motor nuclei. Uh, and then they're going to synapse with another neuron cell body that then goes out to whatever muscle we're having uh, the intention to affect. Um, it's worth noting for purposes of quizzes and exams in the future that the only place that synapses occur in the spinal cord are in the gray matter. In the gray matter is the only place that efferent motor nuclei synapse. In fact, it's the only synapse they have. They go straight from the brain, right down the spinal cord, synapse in the gray matter of the spinal cord and go straight out to the body. There's only one synapse and it happens in the gray matter. So on the flip side, we have tactile sensation, proprioception, pain, etc coming from the skin, bones, and the related structures. These guys enter the spinal cord and then synapse in the somatic sensory nuclei circled over here in green. Uh, they then synapse with a nerve that runs up the spinal cord towards the brain through one of these uh, sensory tracts that are circled over here in red. Once they head to the brain, then they uh, synapse again in the brain or sometimes they will cross over the gray commissure and synapse to a motor nerve on the other side. Um, so yeah, so these signals are destined to more than one place. As they come in from the body, they're going to either synapse directly to a motor nerve and head back out to trigger a reflex such as pulling back when you're burning yourself or, or, or something along those lines. Uh, some of them are going to go up to the brain and some of them are going to cross over and synapse with a motor nuclei on the other side. Okay, but the initial synapse happens right here in the somatic sensory nuclei in the gray matter. Um, so something else you want to notice is the location of the dorsal root ganglion. So this is the cell body for the nerve coming in right prior to synapsing in the gray matter. This is the cell body of the uh, nerve that comes in from the body, from the skin or muscle or whatever it's coming in from. Uh, these dorsal root ganglion live next to the spinal cord and they are formed from neural crest cells as opposed to neural tube cells. We're gonna talk more about that later on though. Now, next we have the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is subdivided into two different divisions of autonomic nerves. We have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So the parasympathetic exits the, exits the central nervous system only directly from the brain and from the lower part of the spinal cord. The sympathetic nervous system uh, exits the spine only in the thoracic region and uh, so these are uh, parasympathetic are over here in the red and then sympathetic are here in the black. Uh, these two systems generally oppose each other. Uh, you, I mean, so you'll notice they come out of different parts of the spine, but they go to all the same organs, right? They go to all the same organs and they usually oppose, they have opposing actions. Um, so the sympathetic is generally considered to be the fight or flight system. Uh, it creates actions in the organs that are going to prepare you to either fight or run away. 
right? In the stomach, it slows down digestion. In the kidneys, it slows down urine production. You can do, do those things later. You need to fight the bear right now. Um, in the lungs, it increases activity in your lungs. It increases activity in your heart. It widens the pupil of the eye. It does all these sort of things to prepare you for a fight or to run away, to save your life, to change your circumstances. The sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, uh, tends to have the opposite effect. It tends to slow down your lungs. It tends to slow down your heart. It tends to create more activity in your stomach and your intestines and your kidneys. It tends to cause you to secrete more hormones and, uh, <clears throat> and things of that nature, uh, you know, for in between the fights and the hunts and the, and the other things that you do that require a lot of adrenaline. Both of these systems are efferent only. There are no signals returning to the brain in the autonomic nervous system. 100% exiting the brain, going to tissues, glands, muscles, etc. all efferent nerves in the autonomic nervous system. So the parasympathetic uh, exits, like I said, directly from the brain or from the lower part of the spinal cord. Uh, and those nerves, run out towards the organ or gland or tissue that it's meant to affect and then they synapse somewhere near the the point that it's meant to affect right so for example if you've got this one that's going out to the lower intestines the synapse will be somewhere near the intestines um, whereas the sympathetic trunk uh, the sympathetic nervous system exits the spine in the thoracic region, only in the thoracic region where you have ribs. As it exits, they come into this structure called the sympathetic trunk. And the sympathetic trunk is full of ganglia, uh, which house cell bodies. So this is where this, the first synapse happens for the sympathetic nervous system. From here, it will travel out to the muscle, tissue, organ, whatever it's supposed to affect um, after it synapses relatively near the spine. Okay, so now that we've got a basic gist of where we're trying to end up, let's take a look at how this thing develops. All right, so as the neural tube starts to form, as it forms, really even as it's just starting to form, uh, it, it begins to differentiate. Uh, as the cells differentiate, you start to, they start to organize themselves in a pretty specific way. Pretty quick, you, you begin to see these three distinct zones forming. We, ha forming. we have the ventricular zone, the intermediate zone, and the marginal zone, okay? Um, so from the ventricular, so ventricular zone, the cells that exist in this zone uh, are eventually going to differentiate into glial cells. Glial cells are support cells, right? It's like astrocytes, uh, oligodendrocytes, and, uh, and other types of cells. These guys become the blood-brain barrier. They uh, have nutritional support, signal transfer, things like that. Uh, the intermediate zone is where all of the neurons form, right? That might be something worth writing down because it's going to probably be on a quiz or a test or both that the intermediate zone is where all of the neurons form. All the nerve cells form right here. Okay. As the nerve cells form, they start to um, a part of their... Um, cell membrane, a part of their cytoplasm, they start to stretch out and, and uh, with part of their cell, uh, part, of the, the part of their cell membrane, excuse me, I'm sorry, I can't talk right now. So parts of their cell membrane begin to stretch and reach out. And as they do that, they form this marginal zone. And what the marginal zone is, these are destined to become axons of the nerve cells as they stretch out and, and head over to the different structures that they're going to um, innervate. So, and that's destined to become the white matter of the spinal cord, right? So it's important to remember that the marginal zone is formed of axons that form the white matter portion of the spinal cord. That's also important to know for quizzes and tests or both. After a bit, you end up with something like this. So right here, you'll see in between the alar and basal plates, right, you have this sulcus limitans, and this is just a little space, a little gap, a little depression in between the two plates. 
Um, the thickening of the neural tube does not happen evenly. It happens much faster on the sides. So you end up with these nice thick walls and these nice thin roof and floor, right? Um, the cells in the intermediate zone start to differenti differentiate into alar plates and basal plates. Um, at this point, these cells that are in these neuro or um, alar and basal plates are called neuroblasts. And the reason they're called neuroblasts is because at this stage of the game, they're still able to actively divide and reproduce themselves. As they become more mature and turn into full-fledged neurons, they will no longer be able to reproduce and create new cells. But at this stage, they still can. So they're called neuroblasts. These are a type of stem cell. Now, as the alar and basal plates continue to differentiate, uh, the alar plate is going to become the dorsal horn, which is where all the afferent nerves synapse on the way up and in. And the basal plate is going to become the lateral and ventral horns, where efferent nerves synapse and go uh, on their way down and out. Right? So dorsal horn synapse on the way in and up, ventral and lateral horns synapse on the way down and out. Uh, also, as more axons are added, more nerve cells develop, and more axons are added, the white matter becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and thicker and thicker and thicker. And what's going to happen is they're going to meet and press up against each other on the dorsal side here, forming that um, po uh, dorsal median sulcus. And then they're going to come very near each other and form this narrow space on the anterior side called the uh, ventral median fissure or anterior median fissure. Now, one other thing um, that you need to know about, um, there's another kind of cell that you see throughout the brain in the spinal cord. And these kind of cells are called microglial cells or microglial cells, depending on which professor is pronouncing it. Um, I don't personally care how you say it. These guys are not made of neural tube or neuroectoderm. In fact, they're not made of ectoderm at all. They're actually made of mesenchyme. <clears throat> and mesenchyme comes from mesoderm. So what happens is as blood vessels begin to infiltrate the central nervous system, a certain percentage of these um, blood vessels and blood cells, uh, a certain percentage of the mesenchyme cells differentiate into what's called microglia cells. So uh, around the rest of the body, you have white blood cells, right? That serve immune function. Uh, in particular, you have one that's called um, the macrophage. And the macrophage is kind of like uh, the cops, right? They run around and they find the bad guys and they gobble them up before they have a chance to do any damage. Uh, and then they take them and they present them to the, anyway. So they're, they're, they're the guys that, that run around and gobble up the bad guys um, before you have antibodies for them. Uh, so the microglia function as the macrophages of the central nervous system. Right, you have the blood brain barrier and the white blood cells have a hard time getting through the blood brain barrier. So these guys serve that purpose in the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. Two things that you're gonna to need to know for the quiz, okay? Microglial cells or microglial cells, whatever you prefer, they are made of mesenchyme arising from mesoderm not ectoderm. They are not made of ectoderm. They are made of mesenchyme. The other thing that you need to know is that in the central nervous system, they serve the same function as a macrophage. So write that down somewhere. somewhere. Microglial cells or microglial cells are not made of ectoderm. They are made of mesenchyme. They serve the same function as a microphage, but in the central nervous system instead of throughout the rest of the body. Okay. So meanwhile, you have this other piece of primordial tissue hanging out above and to the side of the neural tube called the neural crest. Remember this guy? <laughs> so this guy is going to separate and differentiate uh, into these dorsal root ganglion, as well as all of the peripheral nervous system ganglia um, uh, the autonomic nervous system, all of the entire peripheral nervous system, uh, all of the ganglia are going to come from this neural crest. Uh, these cell bodies get sent out, or sorry, these cell bodies send out axons that go all the way through the entire body and connect to either sensory cells, glands, organs, tissues, 
everywhere throughout the whole body. We're gonna talk more about this later. First, we gotta finish up the spinal cord. Next up, we have the meninges. So there's three of them. You have the, the pia mater, the arachnoid mater, and the dura mater. That's from the inside working outward. Um, <clears throat> initially, there are not three distinct layers. The, so the neural tube by about week four and five has become surrounded by these three distinct layers of tissue. Uh, two of these layers are derived from neural crest cells and the other is derived from intraembryonic mesoderm or mesenchyme. So the two inner layers are the pia and arachnoid matter. Uh, and these ones are the ones that are derived from neural crest cells. And you are gonna need to know that for the quiz. The pia and arachnoid matter are derived from neural crest cells. Um, so these two layers are collectively called the, le the leptomeninges. And at first they're not distinct, but as they begin to mature, you see these little fluid filled spaces that form in between them. And as happens in so many other places in your body, these fluid filled spaces become larger and join together until the two layers are eventually fully separated by the subarachnoid space. As the subarachnoid space forms, the two layers remain connected to each other uh, by those thin strands of connective tissue that you remember we, we showed that when we covered the brain. They have these thin little tethers that connect the pia and the arachnoid um, to each other. So the outermost, outermost layer is called the uh, dura mater. This dura mater is formed, uh, it's made of a, fuff, a, fuff, a tough fibrous tissue uh, that is formed from mesenchyme tissue, okay? So you'll wanna know that for the quiz as well. The outermost layer called the dura mater is formed from mesenchyme tissue while the inner two layers called the pia and arachnoid are derived from neural crest tissue. So around week, five, so the subarachnoid space gets filled with cerebral spinal fluid from the apertures in the roof of the fourth ventricle, right? We talked, we covered all that in, uh, in the last, or in the, the first part of the chapter, um, but the CSF begins to be produced and starts to flow uh, around week five. Uh, also, just as a side note, uh, the collection of all the meninges surrounding the brain and the spinal cord is often referred to as the fecal sac. You'll hear me probably refer to that. The fecal sac is the collection of all the meninges as they surround the brain uh, and the spinal cord. Uh, also, I forgot to mention this dura mater, um, this thick fibrous tissue, as you start sending out these spinal nerves out of the spinal cord, this dura mater follows them out and it becomes the uh, sheath of the nerves all throughout the entire body, it becomes the nerve sheaths. Um, yeah, and I think that about covers it. Now, uh, we're gonna cut off the first half of the lecture right here. I think the second half of the lecture is just a little bit longer than the first half. Uh, that's okay though, because this is actually a, uh, a pretty good stopping point. Uh, so during the, we'll pick up the rest of this during, um, Lecture 11, part two, later on in the week. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions or you need clarification on anything, like I always tell you every lecture, please write the questions down, write them down and bring them with you to the um, Zoom meeting on Thursday. And then I can clarify anything that needs clarified or expand on it or answer any questions that you have about this material. And again, if I can't answer your question, if you ask me a question I don't know the answer to and you stump me, then great. That gives everybody an opportunity for extra credit points. Uh, so that'll be it for this time. Uh, we'll see you at the next half of this lecture. Aloha.